the Man Crest Podcast, Episode 1. My name is Nick. I am the business and logistics guy. I'm Micah. I'm the uh, lead designer for the project. What is this podcast about? So this is sort of just an introduction. Um, right now, we're live on Kickstarter, and we have a lot of different uh, types of content. I just did a video interview type deal from our last playtest, but this is just more of a more informal setting. Um, people might have watched our Kickstarter video where we explain the entirety of the project, and it's a very like, uh, regimented and uh, planned thing. This is going to be a little bit just easier, more casual, um, tackle some of the frequently asked questions that we've been getting on both the Discord and social media. Yeah, I think the idea was that we've been kind of reserved and hushed about a certain, uh, a lot of things. And after getting kind of bombarded with questions every day about, you know, how does this work? What, what are your plans for this? We thought it'd be easier to kind of stay true to our uh, full disclosure, you know, full transparency and just kind of ramble for 25 minutes an episode and just let whatever comes out, come out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the playtest went great as a result. Uh, I was really happy with the turnout. We had like 30 people mm -hmm. um, playing, which we actually didn't have enough decks for, which is kind of funny, mm -hmm. um, which is always a good sign. Like you don't have as much product as you have players and really helps um, show that we're like growing a little bit faster than mm -hmm. we originally thought. Yeah. Yeah. The first play test was cool. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea to like talk to say anything bad about ourselves, but the first play test, we had a huge turnout. It was 20 something people. Um, and then it, you know, people were kind of quick to take off when they were done, when they were bored, whatever. Um, and the big difference was this time it was like 30, 45 minutes after the shop had closed and we had to kick almost 10 people out, I think. Yeah. It felt really bad because we were getting sort of this rate feedback loop of uh, people talking about what they thought was great. People thought what needed work and some of their favorite parts. And it was really unfortunate to kind of shut that uh, focus group down and say, Hey guys, uh, need to need to close the shop a little bit here. Right. So. And it was, it was the most filtered down group of the people, just the most hardcore, you know, analytical people that were, I don't know that, that stuff always impresses me from a, I wouldn't say I'm a casual, you know, tabletop game player. I, I, I played card games and board games forever. Um, but I, I don't do well personally with deck building and kind of that like crazy analytical side. So it's really wild to hear these people all, you know, discussing, discussing a concept or a problem and all of them immediately coming to the same conclusion as for the resolution. That was, yeah. it was really wild. It, it was really cool. Um, cause we also had a nice mix of people that had just been introduced to the game as well as some people that were there from the first play test. And uh, so they were able to be like, no, 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 they changed some things from the last time I played it to this time. So people could kind of see the roadmap for improving even still, which is really the goal for any game design project is mm -hmm. to really listen to the community and hear what they're wanting to play and lean, lean into it. Mm -hmm. What was the most significant change from the first play test to the second? So other than just um, some gameplay decisions, which we can get into as well, the format for this playtest was just drastically different. Um, the first time we did it, uh, we gave everyone a single copy of every card in their faction. And that was, uh, it was helpful because we were able to just notice the outliers of cards that just were completely either broken or underpowered immediately. But this time we did, um, I went ahead and built decks for the three factions, uh, Necromancer, Crownsman, and um, Warlord. Warlords. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we went ahead and ran those decks out and everybody got a chance to sort of see what constructed is going to feel like that feeling when you're really battling your opponent instead of just learning every card in your, in your deck, which mm -hmm. is um, always just even for seasoned players, that's just a lot to ask for. Mm -hmm. So that format I think was a lot better. Um, it allowed players to really sink their teeth into it. And then we also had some small gameplay decisions. Um, I say small, but we removed blocking from the game. We removed uh, interrupts. So you can't really play anything on your opponent's turn. You can't activate things on your opponent's turn anymore. No decisions either. No. Um, it's just a lot easier from a player's perspective when you can just really, while your opponent's playing, you don't have to worry about interacting with anything that's happening. And you can start planning out your turn. And then likewise for both players. And then while it is your turn, you don't have to worry about any decisions that your opponent might be making. It really allows you to take ownership of your entire turn and sequence it correctly. Mm -hmm. which I think is the main difference from Mana Crest from other games is the idea that it is all about sequencing and deck building instead of just sort of trying to catch your opponent off guard or mm -hmm. sort of angle shooting to make a, make a point and all that. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a lot of, it's probably poor form to mention other card games, but Pokemon I think plays more to that than mm -hmm. you know, maybe Hearthstone and Magic where it is. What I learned when I was playing Pokemon at uh, the TCG is that it is, it's 
your deck building is the game. And then it's almost like an auto chess kind of thing where like it just kind of happens. You know, there's some there's some nuance to your play style and how, how you go about your turns, but the bulk of it is just you're you're focusing on your deck building and it's it's not so much that kind of obnoxious back and forth and the, the kind of like gotcha parts, which I guess some people enjoy in a game, but I think it creates a more not not a smarter game. That's not what I'm trying to say, but a, a more a more calculated kind of play style. It is a, you have to think way farther ahead and not rely on these kind of gotcha cards. Yeah, I mean, every game that has interaction between both players on every phase of the game, you're looking at just a steep learning curve. I remember I was teaching, I've been teaching people how to play Magic for just a really long time and uh, explaining how like you should really use your instance on your opponent's turn, not your turn, and use sorceries and stuff like that just to bring up another card game. but explaining the nuance of the game that has developed over its lifespan to a new player it really is just daunting whereas mana crest i mean you could open a booster pack flip it upside down shuffle it a little bit and you can just immediately play it Mm -hmm. because the rules are simplistic enough that you can jump right in and then um, most of the decisions are in deck building and sequencing so it is sort of that when you show up to a matchup you know there's still plenty of decisions to be made, but you're not necessarily having to do um, too much spur of the moment thinking to try and pull an advantage. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, I'm a big fan of not having interrupts personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Um, for a number of reasons, especially on the digital side. Um, again, I, I, I should steer away from referencing other card games, but it's a compliment this time is magic arena got it right with their, the way that, you know, Magic is a game that prompts your opponent every single step, you know, of the of your turn to interact. Um, and in previous versions, I think it's called you know, Duels or like, you know the Xbox yeah. versions, the PC versions. The games were very, very, very long. Um, Fifteen minute games took an hour plus because every single step of the way it was prompting you, or you passed all those interrupts, and then your opponent knows, oh, he doesn't have anything. Yeah. Um, and they they finally fixed that in Arena. But it, we sat down for a long time and thought, you know, how do we go about implementing this tastefully, you know, in a similar way that Arena did? Um, what we found at the end of it was interrupts just don't make for a very quick game. You know, if, if you allow that, it, it makes the game so much longer um, in, the, in the context of a digital game. Right. And interrupts also just really, as from a holistic standpoint, they really punish new players, but reward existing players and enfranchised players. Um, it allows you to really separate the good from the bad players because the good player will always make the optimal play every time and then the bad player will make the suboptimal play and it really is just sort of a waiting game for who's going to make the first mistake Mm -hmm. which from a psychological standpoint is really hard when you lose those games because now you're focusing on oh i made this mistake it's my fault i lost or you almost have like the gambling philosophy or uh, problems where it's like no 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 it wasn't me it was this thing Mm -hmm. it wasn't me at all and it's a lack of accountability or it's too much accountability. And that just isn't fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a lot of players all the time when they're playing any of other card game or board game even. And they really just look at me like, man, I can't wait for this to be over. Mm-hmm. I hold uh, TCG tournaments at the store that I manage. And it really comes down to in a three-round tournament, I'll have somebody who gets the buy first round. They'll win the second round. And then they'll split the third round. So for an event that they came out for, they spent five dollars or whatever to play the least amount of games possible Mm -hmm. and that just doesn't really speak to the confidence from the consumer level whereas mana crest i really do feel like because there's no interrupts because it's all sequencing for yourself like you're working on a goal personally versus your opponent i think that it really allows you to speak to your individuality and your decision making when you're deck building instead of just saying like oh well don't forget you have to include these 20 resource cards otherwise you're going to lose the game Mm -hmm. it's no, no, no. Turn one, how are you going to start playing the game immediately? Mm-hmm. And I think that's just really, really different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off, I guess, my original question of what else changed, um, we did get rid of the interrupts, um, all that stuff. The, the card design is just short of finalized. Um, it was a, a very early version. You can see it on the Facebook page or the Facebook group um, of the Strongarm Fast Claw, uh, a more kind of classic card game frame. Uh, and now we've gone for a more modern kind of uh, the physical card looks truer to like a digital game, which I think is cool. It's nice and clean and sleek. Mm-hmm. Um, that was finalized. Uh, all the cards were printed in color, which sounds like a, a dumb thing to be proud of. But 
it's um just a a a, a little self promo. We're also going to be releasing a game design podcast kind of separate. It's going to be the same team, the same cast. We're going to bring guests on and stuff like that. But if you're listening to this just as much for the game design side of it as you are for Mana Crest, keep an eye out for that um, because we'll get into kind of nitty gritty of it and the logistics of how to start a company and how to produce a game um, because it's something that we talk about in the office all day. So we figured why not involve people in that. Um, And a portion of our community we found has come to just watch a game be made um, just as much as they like Mana Crest. Um, but anyway, color cards, that was cool. Um, each card had unique art. Um, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. We finalized our art and it was very cool. Um, we've, we've been really lucky to work with crazy, crazy talented artists. Um, and to like directly in person, you know, while people are playing the game, just as much as they're complimenting, you know, that this is a cool interaction. This is a cool card, whatever they're saying. Oh, I love the art on this card. Oh, this, this is my favorite thing. Um, people are messaging us on discord asking, where can I get prints of these cards? And can you include these in the Kickstarter rewards? Um, speaking of Kickstarter, our Kickstarter launched on December 1st. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not aware of that, uh, it's, you can go to manacrest.com slash Kickstarter. Um, that'll take you directly to the Kickstarter page. If you just want to learn more about the game, it's manacrest.com. But we've got some of the coolest, you know, similar to how the game was designed, just take all the best games, your favorite parts of the games, and kind of squeeze them down into one. We did that with Kickstarter and rewards. Uh, we looked at the most successful games and kind of our own personal preference as far as what rewards we would want for X amount of dollars and really like got ourselves on a shoestring kind of profit margin, but made it so we could give the absolute coolest rewards possible. Yeah. Um, this is this Kickstarter just is a, uh, a kind of a glorified pre-order system as much as it is a, like a crowdfunding, you know, supporting thing. And, We've seen that in the, the tiers that people kind of opt for. Um, if, so my point is, if you'd like to contribute to the project or just take a look if you're not already kind of in that zone, uh, manacrest.com slash Kickstarter. Yeah, and if you have a character or any sort of, like you're a longtime TCG fan and there's a card that you have always wanted to see like in the actual on paper or on your computer played in a game, there is even a uh, level for backers where you can work with me personally to help design a card for a future set which i think is as a avid tcg fan i think that's really cool Mm -hmm. um gives people a chance to really own a part of the game Mm -hmm. and represent themselves in it which is kind of why we all do this i think Mm -hmm. and people are excited about that um i was surprised by how many people reached out and asked like you know if i sign up for this one can we do something like this and that and it's been they are response that has always been yes because they're you know not not insane requests or anything like that but a a really cool opportunity to like micah said get your get your own little piece of mana crest you know get it in there Mm -hmm. um the tiers i won't list them all they start you know with one dollar it's a a thank you and a your name in the credits and they kind of scale up from there um each one of them is just so generous i know i've said that a million times but the you know starting at 10 25 bucks or whatever you get a, a handful of starter decks both physical and digital um, and from there, it scales up with booster packs and eventually getting into some kind of cool exclusives like digital card backs. Um, we have some physical play mats. Um, and then when you get way high up there, we've got leather, leather custom made, you know, one time print run, never again, um, custom play mats, which are really, really cool. Yeah. Um, it's just all around. I know I, I wouldn't say it if it weren't the case, um, but it's a... It's a good Kickstarter. <laughs> there's, there's lots of good stuff no, I there. mean, like, just sort of with the project, I mean, we announced on the Kickstarter video, like, our goal is to make a good game, not to become billionaires who own Tesla trucks. Like, we're really trying to make a, uh, just a product that we're proud of and a community that can be proud of it. I mm-hmm. mentioned it in, once again, just a plug the playtest video that we did, but I mentioned that other games are kind of shying away from their communities right now, not really representing all of the decisions that they're the community is wanting and we're trying to be the first community led game uh, mm-hmm. the first game that really listens and works hard at providing the best gameplay experience for every type of player mm-hmm. and that it also goes into like kickstarter backers and stuff like that where we if you're looking for a particular type of um, award or prize or something we're happy to look into it and we're mm-hmm. happy to accommodate because we just want that kind of experience across every phase of the game right it's a really interesting kind of thing. You go into any community for any popular game. Let's totally pick a, sh- a random one, you know, Call of Duty or Counter-Strike or something. If you go on the subreddit and you stick around for a month or two, 
I guarantee you see the same complaint upvoted 2,000 times every couple of days. And it, it puzzles me. And I understand there's logistical things in place that stop things from moving forward. But it seems to be the case with almost every big game, every big property, where there's a, a big giant consensus complaint. And it seems like the studios kind of plug their ears for whatever reason. Yeah. And I've, I've never, ever understood that. Um, and we're, our entire goal is to avoid that um, as much as possible. I, I, think, I think it is, like I said in the Kickstarter video, I think it is possible to turn a healthy profit for us, make sure we stay afloat, but also not kind of sell out and close our eyes and plug our ears um, in, in favor of you know, whatever it ends up being. Yeah, and to any retailer that might be on the fence. I mean, I've been in the industry for like seven or eight years now. Uh, from a board game LGS standpoint and I've been able to see all of the changes that have been happening for like the big three like Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh um, for a long time and how it's so apparent how many times the LGS also kind of gets thrown aside in the name of like bigger profits by these uh, these industry staples and so we also want to make sure that we're taking care of the LGS with like a proper map system, a proper MSRP system. That way you don't have to worry about your competitors gouging you until you can't have a community anymore. And uh, that's why we have a retailer bundle on the Kickstarter as well. That's um, something that I be truly believe in is just getting the retailers on board because I mean, as much as, as much fun as uh, kitchen table magic or kitchen table Pokemon is, I really believe that organized play is the number one reason anyone plays anything. Um, just going out and being able to compete, and that's why we're going to have leadership, uh, leaderboards um, for all sorts of play and that kind of thing. That way you can really track how you're doing. Um, a big part of what I've done in business in totally unrelated projects is, and it, it sounds real pretentious, but I've looked at common trends and how things are done, and I've kind of reanalyzed them and asked, you know, like, why do we do things this way? Is there a way to do it better? Um, again, that sounds obnoxious, but I think a lot of these companies do just kind of mirror and parrot what these other big companies do. And it's created this trend, this kind of, you know, numb to their community trend of, of making poor decisions or decisions that are great for them, but not so much for the community. Um, and it, just about every step of the way, we're kind of, you know, and we're not, we're not ignorant to anything. I want to reiterate that to anyone who might be questioning it. We aren't, um, we don't have unrealistic expectations about things and we're not kind of, you know, I guess, ignorant to the reality of our situations. Um, but there are so many things that we've looked at along the way of, you know, our initial discussion is, well, we have to do it this way because it's the way it's done. We've sat down and thought about it. Our distribution is a really good example. And I, I won't get into that too much on this podcast, but maybe on the game design one where we're handling the bulk of our own distribution, um, our shipping, our, our printing, things like that. Um, we're keeping it all in Kansas city locally, um, a really kind of intimate relationship with our, with those, that production pipeline. And it's allowed us to, to kind of make decisions and do things in ways that all these other companies cannot. Uh, we won't run into these same issues, hopefully, you know, unless I'm very ignorant to some reality that I'm not aware of. We won't run into these, these short print runs or these things where these, these companies email you back six weeks later and say, ah, you know, we'll have more of these uh, you know, sometime next year. There's, we can avoid these, these common pitfalls, I think, um, by just actually sitting down and looking at these old processes and saying how can we improve them um and that that like like you were saying kind of carries across the board with our our you know lgs communication we're, we're handling it all in house you know you don't have to handle to discuss with some faceless rep that uh is you know is juggling a, a million other stores for a million other games and they're they're dedicating two minutes a day to each of their you know tasks whatever that might be right i mean i feel like it's it's really easy to promise something like this, but I'm really excited to see it all the way through where our number one goal is customer service mm -hmm. to a point. It's um, customer service to the consumer that is just wanting to play a fun, easy to play battle game. Um, and then it's also customer service to the retailers that want to support that. And I feel like a lot of, you know, faceless reps, like you said, just sort of absorb retailers into their like wallet. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're really trying to focus on what can we do to help the community grow with you and how, how can we help you develop this community into exactly what you're looking for? So I am really excited um, about the Kickstarter right now. We've moved a lot faster than I was originally expecting, mm -hmm. but 
I feel like there's still a long way for us to go at a reasonable pace for us to still reach that quarter one launch that we're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we are getting more and more active on social media, kind of reaching out to these different communities. Um, we're going to ramp up what we're doing on our end as far as, for one, the, the kind of sprinkling of content and, hey, check out these teases and check out this lore, um, which we've been really good about the lore. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, manacrest.com slash blog um, has got lots and lots of lore stories. Um, we're also going to be starting you know, closer toward the end of it, getting into giveaways and things like that where you can kind of pre-claim some, some physical product or some digital product, um, kind of opening up that that sign up for our the beta version of the the digital client um there's just there's so much going on it's it's really hard to convey what all we're doing what all is being planned and 